and we are talking all things uh, tracks tonight, all things animal tracks. And so one of the one of the many questions that I get uh, at the park district is about identification. And sometimes that's with animals or plants. Sometimes that's with the tracks that the animals make. And so it's kind of exciting to see what shows up in your backyard after a snowfall. Uh, we've had plenty of that this year and plenty of opportunity to see different tracks. And some of them are easy to identify and other ones are a little more challenging. And tonight is designed for those of you who um, have either no knowledge of track ID um, or you know just a little bit of knowledge and you want to brush up on some tips of you know what how to identify different animals because we it is such a huge amount of information on track ID um, I'm not going to get uh, dig down really deep I just want to make sure that you get a good primer to and some uh, instructions and tips and guidance uh, to at least steer you in the right direction. That said, if you get stumped and you have a track in your in your yard, please, by all means, snap a picture of it. It's more helpful if you can uh, give me a picture with something to scale so that I know what uh, you know, about how big it is. Uh, but if you want to email that to me, I'm happy to uh, give my opinion and even pass it on to some um, some other track ID friends um, if I can't figure it out. So I'm happy to help in that way. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right. Um, first, I'm going to go through a list of different things that you should consider as you're trying to narrow down your track ID. Track identification with animals is really just like a bit of detective work. So your, your goal is to collect as much information as you can and based on the knowledge that you have about the animal. And even if you aren't familiar with the particular um, animal that your track ends up being, using these considerations is going to help you narrow it down. So the first thing is the season. The reason I say that is because we have some animals that you simply are not going to see, at least in our area, this time of year, or because they're hibernating. Like for example, if you have a track that you see in December in Ohio, especially northern Ohio, and you identify that as a groundhog, well, I'm sorry to say that was incorrect because groundhogs are our one true hibernator in Ohio, and they are underground that time of year. So there's no way that they could be out and about to make it a track for you. Next is habitat and geography. So are you in a wooded area? Are you near a stream? Are you in a meadow area? And where exactly are you in the state? So all of the animals that I'm going to be talking about tonight are ones that you can find in Portage County. But of course, um, and I'll, there's a few tricky ones that I'll talk a little bit more about when we get to the slides, but you just want to keep that in mind. Is it in the right zone? Is it possible that that animal could be here in Portage County, right? And then finally, the substrate. So uh, mud, so like March and April is a great time to identify tracks. Mud gives the best, especially our Portage County mud, gives the best um, identifiable track print. And uh, that's because you can really, tend, you tend to be able to see a lot more detail. And with our clay soils, uh, the tracks stay intact pretty nicely. And so it's easy to get detail. However, you don't see them as often. So the best time to see tracks is in the winter because we've got plenty of snowfall, uh, particularly in years like this. And uh, it's really easy to um, see, you know, see the tracks out and about. However, snow is tricky. It makes everything just a little tricky because uh, the track in a snow, identifying a track in snow is going to, you're really faced with a lot of considerations. So how, what, what is the texture of the snow? How much moisture is it? Is it fluffy snow or is it real heavy packed snow? How deep is the snow? And probably most importantly, when it comes to tracks in the snow, how long has that track been there? And has it been very sunny or has it been overcast that day? Tracks in the snow can quickly spread from, you know, like double in size. And so suddenly your one inch track looks like a two inch track. And I'll show you some examples of how that gets those of us excited if we are really looking for something in our yard or in our on our property, how it can uh, really lead us down that sad tunnel <laughs> of identification. So just know and be thinking about what is the substrate that your, your track is, um, your track print is in. Um, next, let's look at the 
the whole pattern of the track. So look at the big picture. Very rarely are you going to be able, at, at least now at this stage, are you going to be able to identify a, a track just by one single track. Um, or I shouldn't say very rarely, I'll say very rarely. You don't want to count on that one single track because nature has exceptions and, uh, and you know, there's lots of variability in, you know, in different animals and in, um, in the pressure that they're putting down and the substrate that they're in. And so you want to look at the bigger picture if you can. So if you can pay attention to the gait pattern, that's their, um, how are they moving? What's their gait? How are they walking? How are they um, you know, moving from one place to another? And then the stride, which is, um, the length between the prints, that's the stride right here, and the straddle, which is the width between the prints. Now, these, uh, this isn't going to be as important when it comes to, um, this is something I just wanted to put out there and let you know for the, the animals that we're identifying today, um, this is going to be less important for identifying the different groups of animals and more important to identifying the different species within those groups, if that makes sense. So, but just so you know what stride and straddle, if you happen to see those terms when you're doing your identification, those are some things to consider. And finally, and in my opinion, this is the most important list, <laughs> does it have, how many toes does it have, or does it have toes, and does it have claws? Those are really important questions to ask yourself when you're looking at a track. Also, is there a tail print present? Um, some animals that will make a tail print don't always make a tail print, but the presence of a tail print can um, really help you identify and help you ex or help you exclude other options. So pay attention to that. The tail print would be like if we look here at this uh, diagram uh, about where that dotted line is here, kind of right between in the middle is where you would see most tail tracks. I've got some uh, really cool photo to show you later of one that I found on my parents' property. Um, track size. So what's the size of the individual print itself and what's the shape of the print? And so again, I'm going to give you some tips tonight of um, what to look for in those different categories. This is, I'm going to go through this very quickly. In fact, the next few slides we're going to go through pretty quick so we can get to some of the tracks themselves. So speed matters when it comes to um, track ID. This is a continuum from the slowest, the stalking mode, where you've got the predator slowly stalking its prey, all the way to the gallop. And depending on how fast an animal is moving, um, can change what its tracks actually look like. So just keep that in mind. Again, it's nature, there's exceptions to most rules, right? So I'm going to go through a few different categories of movers. So this is how they move. What does their gait look like? Um, the first is diagonal walkers. And these are animals that move the opposite side of their body, usually you know, four-legged creatures, opposite side of the body at the same time. So their right, um, right front and their left rear move simultaneously. Sometimes that ends up looking like they're stepping in their uh in their previous tracks, sometimes you end up with, um, you know, clear definition between both their hind legs and their front legs. And these animals tend to either stalk, slow walk, walk, or, or gallop. The animals that fall into that, whoopsies, the animals that fall into that, um, that category are deer, um, all the canines. So this is dogs, coyote, and fox. That's pretty much what we're gonna we're gonna see here in, in Ohio and then the felines in our case we're either gonna see cats domestic cats or bobcats and this is what that gate looks like for those diagonal walkers um, like I said sometimes you'll see all four so you'll see um, you know front and rear front and rear um, and then oftentimes they will also uh, be stepping in their um, their own footstep now that is usually influenced by the speed with which they're moving. So if you go back to that previous slide of how fast are they moving, um, that's one of the factors in how those prints are gonna show up on the ground. The next group is our bounders. This is one of my favorite groups. <laughs> our bounders, um, they form tight clusters of prints, sometimes even on top of each other, um, where their front and their back feet are next to each other. I'll show you the diagram here in a second. However, 
they may walk, um, they may, their gait may look more like a diagonal walk when they're slowing down or when they're preparing to hunt. So these um, primarily in, in Northeast Ohio, this includes our mustelids, um, like our minks and our weasels. And uh, these guys do, and gals, have a, a fun, um, fun way of moving. So if you look at point A here, this is where their front feet hit the ground, leaving those front footprints. Then their back legs come down just behind the front feet, and then they lift off from the back legs and start that cycle over again. So their direction of movement is to the right here. So you end up with your, your front feet, the front footprints are the direction of travel. And see how they're tightly clustered? Sometimes, like I mentioned before, these two will be, their back feet will actually come down almost, almost in the same spot as their front feet. Um, so sometimes they're a lot closer together there. Keep that in mind. Um, you'll see that in some of our photos. Um, next we have the hoppers. Uh, they're also, depending on the source that you use, they can be referred to as gallop walkers. I refer to them as the hoppers, the hopping group. And in this group, their hind feet land in front of their front feet. Uh, and rarely, but they will diagonal walk if they need to cover a short distance. And this group includes the rabbits, the squirrels, and a lot of our smaller rodents like uh, white-footed mice. We are not going to get into small mammal ID today. Um, and like our small rodent ID, I would love to. Uh, but frankly, we'll be here until, you know, nine o'clock. So... <laughs> So this is an example, a diagram of how those hoppers move. And so they land just like with the bounders, they land with their front feet. But when they land with their back feet, they actually pull those back feet in front of their front feet, which means the direction of travel can be indicated by where their back feet are. So their back feet are in the direction towards the direction of travel. Um, the, the dialogue down at the bottom of this, uh, I left this in, um, they say tree dwellers land parallel, land dwellers land on a diagonal. I say squirrels and rabbits <laughs> because the squirrels do tend to land in a blockier shape. So when you look at a uh, squirrel print, um, they're often you know really blocky in, uh, in nature. Whereas a rabbit tends to have a more elongated print. The front feeder or the back feeder still in, towards the direction of travel, um, but those two back, uh, th those front feet marks that are behind uh, the back feet marks aren't, aren't symmetrical, aren't side by side. And the final group of movers that I'm going to share today are the pacers. Some people call them waddlers. And these guys uh, tend to do a little more of a shuffling motion. They alternate feet. Depending on how fast they're moving, their tracks may also be on top of, the, of, of uh, one another. And this group includes uh, raccoon. This is an example of raccoon tracks. Uh, skunk, or in Northeast Ohio and Portage County, um, we have the striped skunk and the Virginia possum. So those are more of a shuffle alternating um, foot motion. Congrats, everybody. 100% <laughs> of you got it right. <laughs> it is, in fact, a white-tailed deer. I had decided to start off with an easy one for you. So this is a white-tailed deer print. And actually, the picture on the upper right side is the same set of tracks that uh, the quiz photo showed. Um, they are, of course, those diagonal walkers. And their prints can range in size uh, anywhere from about an inch to four inches or more, depending on the size of the deer. I will say when I first started learning about tracking, um, there was information about whether it's a doe or a buck. And um, now a lot of the, um, a lot of the mammologists that I've been um, following are saying, well, I think it's more about size than about the, the track. So that the size has more impact than the sex of the animal. So uh, easy, uh, this is in Ohio. It's the only animal that is going to make this kind of track. Unless, of course, you're near a farm that has goats. 
uh, cattle are slightly different sheep. Um, but if you're out in, in the woods, this should be the only thing that we would expect to see that would make these tracks. I did include an extra slide here for white-tailed deer just because they have so many other types, other signs of uh, being around. Uh, these, a few of these are from uh, our volunteer, Joe, you'll see his name quite a bit because he's um, contributed lots of pictures uh, to our uh, catalog. But one could be a scrape here uh, the, where the buck has scraped its antlers on the, a small tree. Um, we have these little um, uh, areas where the deer have been searching. This was at Morgan Park down in the bottom right where we uh, the deer were searching for acorns. There's a lot of oaks in that area. It's so interesting when you've had a heavy snowfall how they are able to find um, find all of the, the the nuts underneath that heavy snowfall and of course their scat now that could be a whole topic in and of itself as identifying different types of animal scat but again look for clues that might not be related directly to the track that you're looking at remember we're being detectives when we're looking so let's take a look at the next who is it so the next uh, question for you who is this one? Now, before I put up the poll, I just want you to um, pay attention to a few things. Remember, count those toes. How many toes do we have? Are there claws? Do we have tail marks? Those types of observations. So we're a split group tonight on, on this one. Um, the majority of you um, guessed dog, 24% um, of you guessed coyote, and 6% uh, guest bobcat. So I'm actually so glad that you um, had those had those answers. So a couple things I'm going to point out before I tell you who it is. Um, it has four toes. That's the first thing, four toes. Um, this lower pad, I'm going to refer to it as the lower pad on the foot, um, has one lobe on top. And it's hard to tell here, but uh, I'd say two lobes on the bottom. And then you can also see very faintly, but you can see claw marks on this print. You can tell by the, the walk here that it's that diagonal walker. And we have, those of you who answered Coyote, you are correct. Now, this one is pretty darn tricky though. I'll give you that. Um, because I know where this um, particular one was spotted, it is, um, it, it makes it makes the answer a lot easier. But uh, coyote and dog, coyotes and dogs are very, very similar. And the things that are most similar is the, the canine nature of these prints. So I have all four of these prints. We could possibly see any of these in Portage County. So the coyote, um, these belong to the coyote. They're a little over, right around, we'll say right around two inches um, long. And uh, you'll notice with all four of these prints, the red fox, which we're more likely to see in Portage County than Gray Fox, but it's possible. Um, and the dogs all have four pads, four toes, and they all have claws. Now it's interesting when it comes to the claw, when it comes to the claw question, um, that's one that you, it's not a guaranteed, but they usually will show in a print. It's not guaranteed though. What is guaranteed is that you're gonna have four toes and you're also gonna have one lobe on, on top of that lower pad. And you may or may not be able to see it clearly, but you're gonna have two lobes on the bottom. So at the very least, you can narrow it down to canine. Now, fox prints tend to be a little more spread out. Their lower pad has a little more distance between those toes. Um, but again, that is also not, I, I, you, you, that's not a definitive way to, to ID them. So um, focus on habitat. Where did you, you know, where did you find the print? If you're at Trail Lake Park and you see one, I mean, it could go either way. It's probably not a fox, although we um, certainly could have them there. It's more likely a coyote or a dog. Um, dogs, as you probably know, if you're a pet owner like me, a dog owner like me, then you know that they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, so just think about the, you know, where, where exactly it is that you're located. Also knowing that coyotes um, can be found in both urban and rural and forested areas. So they are all over the place. So it's, it's pretty common that we could find them. But the coyote print isn't going to be bigger than about two and a half inches. And most of them are gonna be around two inches. All right, our next one. So take a close look here. Remember, count the toes, look at the pattern. And 
launch our next one here. Who do you think it is? Who is All right, our results. We have 44% of you who say domestic cat, 38% say bobcat, and 19% say red fox. So all good answers, but only one group is correct. And this is the domestic cat print. Now, this little guy here is my, at the time he was about 18 years old, he's no longer with us, but uh, that would have been the similar to the print that he had if he was allowed outside, which he wasn't. And But what we all were hoping that it was going to be was this guy, which is the bobcat which we do have in Portage County. So there are Bobcat in Portage County. Um, they are elusive and mysterious, but they are there. Um, size is the big difference between these prints. And this is where that snow print can really get us in trouble because we want it to be the Bobcat, right? And that one inch house cat print can easily morph into a two inch Bobcat print. So just remember to be careful with that and also think habitat, habitat. Um, Bobcats are not going to be found in your backyard unless you're adjacent to a wooded area um, or they're unlikely to be found. There are no definites when it comes to wildlife and nature, but um, they're unlikely to be found in your backyard um, if you live in a subdivision or something like that. Um, they are more likely to be found in a wooded area, a wooded environment. And their, um, their tracks are much bigger. Uh, now, Joe gave this great photo um, of a coyote print next to a cat print. And so I want to use this to uh, show a few different things. So first of all, look for the nail marks. Cat prints are not going to have nail marks unless you're looking at a climbing situation because they keep them retracted while they walk. So you're not going to see claw marks. You do see faintly, but you do see the claw marks here on the coyote. Now, if we count the toes, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, the toe count is the same. <clears throat> right here is that lower pad. Um, there's one lobe on top, two lobes on the bottom. That's all consistent with canine. Um, now with the feline print, there's actually two lobes on top and mo usually three lobes on the bottom. Sometimes you can't actually see that in the print. Um, but the other thing that's interesting about these two that's important for ID, and this would apply to the bobcat as well, is the shape of that track. So a canine track is going to be more oval in shape. Okay, you get more of an oval shape of the track, whereas a feline print is going to be more round. So they're just a nice compact round print versus an oval-ish print for, um, for a dog or a coyote. All right, next question. Who is this one? Group, but 43% of you said that uh, it was a mink in this picture. And you would be correct. It is a mink. And so these little guys are common in Portage County. Um, they uh, are most common around bodies of water, um, streams and wetlands. Um, they do have, you count the toes, one, two, three, four, five. They have five toes. If you get a print like you saw in the, uh, if we go back to the, the picture, if you get a print like uh, just straight on in the picture, they just are a little more splayed out, those, those toes. You can sometimes see, like in the picture, it just looks pointy. You don't see a, a break in between those, um, those toe pads and the nail. Um, and but they are uh, they are bounders, remember. So they're in that group that um, jumps and lands with their uh, their front feet first and then their back feet just behind or even right next to uh, the front feet. So uh, the mink, we also have long-tailed weasels that are in. Uh, Portage County, uh, very similar tracks. That's where the um, the stride and the size, uh, that's where measurements really come into play because they have very similar, uh, very similar tracks and styles of walking. I put this picture up because this is my plea to all of you who are out excited about identifying tracks, particularly if you live in the northern part of Portage County, keep an eye out for these prints. These are the prints of the fisher. 
which is related to the mink, but which is much larger than a mink. And they should be in Portage County. Uh, they The fisher is one species that what had been extirpated from the state of Ohio that has now started to move back into the state of Ohio. And we have, there's been documented sightings of them all around Portage County, but none in Portage County. And I think it's solely because we don't have enough eyeballs out looking for them. So it's gonna have that bounding gait, but a much larger, you know, over two inches, um, track size of over two inches, um, whereas our mink is under two and the weasels tend to be even smaller than that. So keep an eye out for the fisher and uh, you will be celebrated amongst the wildlife community. <laughs> All right, next up, who is this? This is a nice easy one, hopefully nice easy one. All right, so we do have a few people who guessed fox squirrel and I can see why you did. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it in a moment here. Um, the If you look at the picture on the right, um, they do seem a little blockier um, here, but when you couple these two together and you see the track pattern here, um, these two are the uh, these two are the front feet and these two are the back feet and it belongs to the Eastern Cottontail rabbit. So uh, down here at the bottom right, that is the typical rabbit track. And remember, because these are hoppers, those, just like the squirrels, those back feet land in the front, in, in front of the front feet. So we know that the direction of travel is in this direction. So in this case, it's going from left to right is the direction of travel. So uh, remember that most of the time, the rabbit tracks are going to not be boxy like the squirrel tracks. So the squirrel tracks are going to look more like a box. The uh, rabbit tracks are going to be more elongated. Now this is one of those tricky pictures. So Lisa, one of our uh, awesome volunteers, sent this picture in and I was puzzled for quite a while. My first instinct was, hmm, because we do see this happen sometimes where you've got um, predator meets prey, right? <laughs> Um, we there's even some great pictures. Um, if you Google uh, uh, angel prints, um, those are the prints. It, it, those are the prints of either owls or birds of prey that have come down to um, grab a little um, critter from the snow, and you'll see those beautiful wing prints there, as well as the kill site. <laughs> so, but I looked here and I thought, well, let's use our detective work, right? So if you can, if you're on a small screen, I'm sorry, you're probably not going to be able to see this. You're just going to have to trust me, but um, it's going in this direction and towards the tree. And I can tell that because of where those back feet are, because clearly this section of uh, track is rabbit. We've got the two back feet as well as the elongated um, pattern of the front feet. So we know it's going towards the tree, but what is this nonsense? Rabbits aren't walkers. <laughs> except when they are. Turns out, occasionally, we have rabbits that will, the rabbit will go ahead and just decide he wants to take a stroll instead of doing his, its normal hopping gait. And I believe that that's what's happened here because there's no other kind of disruption. There's no other, there's no change of direction. So I think this is a rabbit that forgot it was a rabbit until it got right about here and then realized it was time to start hopping again. Um, I have no other explanation for that. So that is my story and I'm sticking to it. And I so appreciate Lisa sharing that awesome picture because is there anything more fun than having to find an answer for something that we're not sure about? So uh, but use those little d detective skills um, based on the knowledge that you have to ID these guys. So who is this? Yeah, this was a tricky one. So uh, the majority of you guessed a muskrat, 64%, 36% of you guessed squirrel, and I'm glad you were paying attention. Nobody guessed the rabbit, which is great because <laughs> we just did that one. Um, and these prints do belong to a squirrel. However, those of you who guessed muskrat, I can understand why you did so. Um, if you're, uh, I do not have muskrat as one that uh, didn't make the cut. We're not doing beavers tonight either, but I see your question, Jan, and I am going to answer that about the about the beavers. Um, but muskrat prints um, do look very similar to that. The reason that uh, the way to to eliminate muskrat as an option, though, is the gait. 
So um, that is a very typical, we'll go back here to it to show, this is a very typical squirrel formation. So you've got those two back feet that have landed um, after the front feet. Remember, they're those, um, those hoppers. So um, this is a great example of using different items to scale, okay, to help help uh, you know, figure out how about how how big are these tracks. So this is a six inch ruler that um, you'll see in a number of the uh, photos that were contributed by Joe because he carries that uh, with him most of the time so that he can use it for this very purpose um, to kind of get an idea of how big those tracks are. Um, this glove is approximately the same size. But look at the size difference between these two tracks. Both of them are in the squirrel formation where you've got that boxy, um, boxy look. The direction of travel is this way. They're both going up. Um, and we know that because these are hoppers. They land with their front feet and then, then second with their back feet over the front. But this one belongs to our tiniest uh, tree squirrel, which is the red squirrel. Uh, they have tiny little little prints, whereas this one belongs to the gray squirrel. Now, why gray squirrel versus uh, fox squirrel, which is our other squirrel that we would find um, in Portage County? Uh, the gray squirrel is slightly smaller, but more importantly, it spends more time um, in the woods. So we, we see them in a, a forested habitat more often. And so this one was in, in a wooded area. Again, though, if we really wanted to get um, particular, um, that's where that gait or the uh, stride and straddle would come in. All right, our next one, our next who is it? All right. So the majority of you, by a slim majority, said raccoon. And a few said possum. And those of you who said raccoon are correct. So you'll notice both the hind foot and the front foot of the raccoon have five toes and they're very finger-like. That would be my um, identification tip for you. They Raccoon prints look strangely like hands and if you've ever seen a raccoon um, feasting on the side of a creek, uh, then you would, you would understand why they're like hands, right? Or feasting in your trash can because they do a great job of getting into those too. So they do have very uh, high level of dexterity in those long fingers. Um, they do have claw marks. Um, as you can see in this picture, uh, the you can really notice those, those claws that are there. Um, I should probably have left a further amount of gait in here because you, you could see this transition into a more typical pacer style. Um, again, these are uh, raccoon tracks are really easy to identify and or easier to identify in mud, in my opinion. Uh, and because of where they often will feed in the wild, along, you know, in wetlands, along streams, uh, it's pretty common to, to see their prints in the mud. So uh, keep an eye out. One place I see them a lot see raccoon tracks a lot or at Dick's Park on the farm trail uh, right when it goes down uh, kind of drops down into the um, drainage pattern there there's a little stream that crosses right in that area I will often see them so keep an eye out when you're along the trail there so that is the raccoon print all right next up we only have two more to go I have nine different uh, question different animals to highlight so who is this one Right. So the majority of you, 86% of you said possum. Um, those of you who said uh, muskrat, I again can understand why you would say that because if you look at this print here, it does have that splayed, um, splayed nature of the, the front paw of the muskrat. Um, however, this is the possum and the uh, identifying characteristic of this possum would be this uh, really almost looks like a dislocated thumb. <laughs> So they have their uh, four little, four little uh, toes that are close together on one side and then just a really strange looking thumb, <laughs> fourth toe on their, their hind leg. And that's the identifying characteristic of the possums. Also, they will often um, 
look just very uh, very finger like similar to a, a raccoon but really it's that that crazy toe that that we're looking for so however <laughs> exceptions right so however I was walking through the woods um, through my parents woods this you know, just a month or so ago and came across this uh, trail that went all the way through the woods and over to the neighbor's shed and I looked and because of the depth of the snow, it was a very sunny day. I was there in the afternoon, so it probably had happened overnight. And so by then there had been some melting. So you couldn't see, you couldn't really count the toes and you certainly couldn't see this, uh, this type of a print. However, using those detective skills, you can clearly see a tail drag. But if it were a, uh, a mink, let's say, uh, first of all, it's unlikely that you would have that long of a distance where you've got the diagonal walking pattern or the, I'm sorry, the pacing pattern. Um, you would tend to have that bounding pattern and you might see that, uh, that, that tail drag right down the center between those, um, those prints. So this is clearly a waddler or a pacer, right? That back and forth movement. And who else has a you know long bare tail that would make uh, that type of a of a track than a possum? So it was pretty easy to identify that. Also looking at the habitat that the uh, tracks were in and where it was headed, <laughs> uh, and then again using something to scale so that you can you can see what uh, approximately what size it is. All right, our last one, who is this? All right, about 80% of you, exactly 80% of you said that this is a striped skunk. And you would be correct. It is in fact a striped skunk. So let's talk a little bit about skunk prints. First of all, in my opinion, they're one of the cutest prints. Skunks are also unique in that they're one of the few animals that will step flat-footed, so you get a nice clean um, print there. I included this picture for a couple reasons. Number one, you can clearly see all their cute little roundish toes. So that's a that's a key for skunks. They have very round, um, like almost a round to uh, oval but they're they're very they're very clear uh, little toe pads and they there's there's five of them on each foot um, one two three four five one two three four five uh, because of their um, pacing waddling selves um, with their gait they will often step on top of their own you know their their uh, track and most of the time, they do have pretty significant uh, claw marks. Now, if we look back at this um, particular quiz, you can see too how much further out they, you know, those claw marks can, you know, can be from their um, their main toe pad. And so, I mean, sometimes you'll see them, like let's say this one had shown up with their claw marks, it would be you know, out of ways because their claws are very long. Their front claws are very long because they use it to um, dig to get grubs and other um, other invertebrates in the ground. And so, uh, skunks. First, I, I would look for again count the toes. That's going to help you narrow it down. If you can see both feet, that's a really good giveaway. Um, that front foot that they don't come all the way down on, um, and then their back um, foot that you can really see that heel print. Um, but also really be looking for those claw marks. Um, they are, you know, a pacer, so uh, they're going to kind of waddle along. However, that can change as they pick up speed. So just keep that in mind too. That 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 gait can change if they're moving a little bit faster. All right, um, that brings us to the end of the program tonight. Um, I did want to point out uh, one of the guides that's pretty helpful, especially if you're just getting started in identifying animals and tracks, um, is the Division of Wildlife's uh, Guide to Ohio Mammals. And so I do have a supply of these um, with the Park District that uh, we received for educational purposes from the Division of Wildlife. And I just